Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this episode of What Has Changed Your Life. Grief is something that affects every single one of us. It's that place we go when we're hurt. And grief can look like different things for different people. And it also can be as long or short as we need it to be. Grief is something that a lot of us like to stifle and not deal with, but today we're gonna talk about how to deal with that in a more helpful, healthy way, as opposed to what we've been taught in the past. And losing a family member is heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And today's guest is Dr. Victoria Wilson Crane, who has a doctorate in education, and she has written a book called 16 Days, where she talks about her grief after the tragic death of her niece and how her and her family got through that process. Thank you, Dr. Wilson Crane, for joining me today on this episode of What Has Changed Your Life. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Nice to see you. So sadly, you tragically lost your niece. How long ago was that? Uh, It was January 2020. So we've just gone over a two year anniversary. Very long at all. And how old was she? She was 22. And she'd graduated from university and she was doing a postgraduate qualification. Um, And yeah, someone who you just think has got everything ahead of her. And um, obviously it was tragic. So there was no, and I hate to say this, you know, I don't want to be like condescending, but when somebody has a a life-threatening disease that is something that is prolonged, like cancer or lung disease or whatever, In a way, you have a little bit of time to prepare, whereas this was very different. It was sudden. Yeah, she died suddenly. She did have an illness. It was only very, very brief. Um, She had a viral illness and um, ultimately it was a condition called encephalitis, which is um, inflammation of the brain, which can take hold very quickly. It's very, very rare, but it's very serious when it happens. Um, So, yes, from the late Friday, Saturday morning, she was unwell and then she died on the Monday so Mm. very very quick um and actually I mentioned that in in the book because I think um if you do have a bit of time I don't think any death is is easy none of this is easy but if you have a little more time there is a bit of time to maybe say things that you want to say or do things Mm -hmm. and that's just not possible with with a sudden death um and that was what we were facing really that none of us expected this and even mm. with warning signs a couple of days before none of us really expected it would come to come to that and, and so quickly absolutely right you're not even you're thinking 22 years old whole yeah whole light the whole light. she'll get through this yeah yeah you wouldn't definitely. think that at all right no and it was, it was definitely a sense that it was um possibly something viral that she would ride out. This was pre-COVID time. COVID was, was just sort of hitting um, and it, it wasn't connected to COVID. Um, right. But even at that time, you know, people have viruses and, and they get unwell. And, and in most cases, your body just has to fight it and, and, and you move on from it. So there was a sense that was, that was probably what was going to happen. And she was poorly. But um, yeah, you don't think something's going to happen so, so quickly and so suddenly. And it's so raw when Mm. it happens Mm -hmm. yeah it was and the and the angle that I've really taken with the with with my writing is um it was so raw for me as her auntie and I was I was close to her I was very close to her Mm -hmm. but there were lots of people who were even closer to her than than I was Mm -hmm. and for me it was that suddenly being plunged into a situation where I not only had to deal with my own grief but also try and support people who in my perception were even closer to her than than, than I was and, and that I am. Yes. So um, yeah, very, very raw. And even just in the communication of that, mm. um, it just was so unexpected. And I, I, I can smile now because I've had a chance to kind of process it, but he tried to kind of fire warning shots to people. And I'd send a text message to say, I, I do need to talk to you. you know, I've, I've, I've got some sad family news and, I'm fortunate I still have my parents, which are obviously my niece's grandparents, and everyone's right. assumption was it was something about them because they're in their 70s and that's the natural order of things. 
exactly. So, so e even by trying to um, trying to preempt those kind of phone calls, it was challenging. Mm -hmm. You made assumptions and and conversely assumed it couldn't possibly be couldn't possibly be my niece. Right. Yes, because you're like, no, this isn't the way things are supposed to go. You're not supposed to bury our children. No. Right. They're supposed to bury us. I know that sounds morbid, but that's the reality. As you say, the natural order of things. Yeah. Yeah. And and then, as you said, you have to take on that supporting role because she has her parents. Who are now dealing with the death of a child, tragically, plus if they're siblings. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that is so hard to do is to be supportive. How do you know? what to say um if i'm honest i didn't at the time at all um and that's actually the premise of, of some of the stuff i've written about because so many people said to me oh, i don't know what to say and i, I totally got it because i didn't yeah. know what to say either mm -hmm. um and it, it, it's it's hard and I, I i don't i don't profess to know for sure what to say in these situations but i i kind of know what i found helpful and i know what our family found helpful and often that was um, people just being there and just listening and listening when we wanted to tell the story over and over again, because that happened. Mm -hmm. um, you, so, so much when, when things happen so quickly like that, so much happened in such a short period of time that I don't think your body and your mind can process it. So yeah. it's actually helpful to to keep going over and it, I don't think it's sort of reliving it or in a kind of indulgent kind of way it's just trying to understand what what on earth happened then because there were a number of very very intense hours and then we're in the situation that we're in so right. I actually found it really helpful when people just listened and mm -hmm. any questions and even just just listened and were present and actively listen and showed they were listening um we were fortunately in the time when we could still hug each other so there were hugs and touches and that sometimes it's not always appropriate but it was sometimes appropriate to have that kind of physical contact with people mm -hmm. um, so very very simple things like that and then oh, i've God. learned I've, mm -hmm. I've definitely learned through um through kind of a lot of reading i've done since as well um it is actually really helpful when people say would you like to tell me a little bit about what happened? Mm. That's quite a, just a gentle way into saying what you really want to say, which your curiosity, natural curiosity, wants to say, what on earth went on there? What on yeah. earth? Yeah. Yeah. Very sort of gentle way in of, would you like to tell me a little bit about what's what's happened? Because often when they say a little bit, they're happy to hang around to hear a little bit more and that's okay. Yeah. So do very very simple things which are probably really obvious and possibly what everybody knows knows what to say um but actually logic and what you know goes out the window when these kind of things happen. yes yes and you're worried about saying the wrong things Thanks. we have robert here joining us good morning robert j moore nice to have you with us and he says greetings my mom would agree as three brothers of his died so sorry so sorry about that so yes what that must be like robert and the, and the thing is, it affects, it's, it affects everyone. Mm -hmm. And it affects everyone differently. And that's the weird thing about grief. Some people cry. Some people go into themselves. Right? And it's weird how it, it, it challenges people in different ways. So how was that process for you? Yeah, for me, um, it took a little while really until I um, I could find the space to know what what I needed to do for, for me, because um, one thing I didn't appreciate and particularly with a sudden um, bereavement, there's an awful lot to do. And, and anyway, when somebody dies, there's a lot of busy things to do. And in our sort of Western culture, we are arranging a funeral for around a week's time. And that involves a lot of people and um maybe you want to look at music and readings and all those kinds of things and you need to choose you need to choose how they're going to going to depart from this world you need to choose their casket and all those kinds of things and if none of those things have been decided there's an awful lot of work to actually do an awful lot of things to do mm -hmm. um so i don't think i even got anywhere near 
thinking about my own way of dealing with this and, and processing this until quite some time after um mm. my niece's and death. that's and that's a natural thing as well i call it what i call going into those situations because it's a traumatic thing i call it nurse mode mm. you go in because you're you're just needing to survive to get through this traumatic event that's happened to you and sometimes it's not till six months a year year and a half later where you finally are able and your body and mind will allow you to feel all the feels that you weren't able at the time because you were just surviving mm -hmm. did you find that as well yeah i think so and and certainly um i think the time between her death and the funeral a lot of that was just still in that shock feeling as well of um, there was lots to do, there were lots of people to talk to, there were lots of decisions to make. Um, so any time to sort of be on my own or to just be with my feelings just wasn't really there for, for quite some time afterwards. So I, I, I really tried to, um, not deliberately, but I really tried to suppress what I was feeling because mm -hmm. I just had this sense that there were people who were even closer than me who were hurting perhaps even more than me yeah. and i needed to really keep my own feelings in a bit of check so that i could support them at the time and i i wasn't doing any of this deliberately as i say it wasn't a case of um oh i, I must do this and be the hero and and, and be the person right. that gets recognized for this it was just a natural thing to think actually i need to just get through this i need to be there for others um, right. and that, that's the priority for me. And Robert says, I was a therapist for 15 years and helped 100,000 people through grieving. But when it happens to yourself, wow, what a wake up. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. Right? Isn't that the truth? It's easier to give the advice than to take it sometimes too, right? It is. And you can know all the theory in the world, but when, when it happens to you, as Robert says, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very challenging. Yeah. And there are different stages of grief. You know, first, sometimes we have denial, right? And then we go into all the different stages of grief. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to challenge that a little bit, though. Um, yeah, I've let's work. Yeah, around um, the grief recovery method. So I've become um, a certified um, grief recovery specialist in, in right. the process of doing this learning. And the Grief Recovery Institute quite quite clearly deny that those stages exist. And that's not at all denying Kubler-Ross's work because that's where it came from. Right. Um, the understanding is that those stages were actually originally designed around um, the stages that a person would go through when they're originally diagnosed with a terminal illness. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's different. true, that's true. And then we understand that a journalist kind of got hold of this and adapted it and either misunderstood or chose to take it to another degree to say this is also about the stages of grief. Um, and actually, if, if you follow the Grief Recovery Institute's work, they will suggest that it's actually unhelpful to think that there are this kind of, um, or there are these linear stages that you will go through grief because actually it's probably for many people a bit more messy than that mm. and it's more complicated. Yeah. And yes. by putting stages and times around it, what you actually do is put pressure on the griever to behave in a particular way at a given yes. time. And we know yes. it's more complicated than that. So um, an awful lot of respect for the work that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did, but there's an understanding that perhaps it's been taken to, um, taken in a different direction where it wasn't originally um, intended. And mm. what that left us with is some understanding for people that perhaps isn't always helpful um when we're going through grief because i think probably one of the main things is it's just so individual and so unique yes but to try and suggest and there are times around it, i guess one of the things as well that people have said to us and i alluded to the fact it's been two years um lots of people said the first year is the worst you know mm -hmm. get through the first anniversary get through the first christmas and yeah. actually all those milestones yeah exactly right? which you get and it is logical but a clock didn't just tick over on suddenly on the first anniversary and I felt hugely better. It didn't happen. Um, now that can happen. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, my way is the only way at all. But I think it's a bit concerning to um, to kind of put pressure on grievers to say, actually, after the first year, you're going to feel significantly different. 
because yeah. many don't. And then if you don't, are you are you broken then? Is there something wrong with you? Mm. Not fitting into this model that that people understand and, and that you've you know, you've you've talked to me about. So I I would I say I would challenge it, but I'm still I'm still sort of working that through in my own head as well because that's something that society has told me. Right. There, there will be stages. I'll be angry. I'll be you know yes. I'll be bargaining. But I, I'm not quite sure how you bargain when somebody has already passed away. I don't know where the bargaining comes into it when yes it's actually occurred. Yeah. Uh, it's that why did they take them and not me? No, yeah, yeah, right. Why? That's that's the bargaining, right? But I, but you're absolutely right because I know people who have lost children specifically, and I remember one of the things that I heard that they were told. You know, they were young parents. Child was ten months old. My cousin, and. The parents were told by the doctors, well, don't worry, you're young. You'll have another one. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, how do you, you can't, you, like, if, if you're looking for something not to say, don't say stuff like that. <laughs> because that is so not helpful no. to people that are grieving. And even to this day, you know, this happened many, many years ago, 17 years ago. It still affects each one of us differently, mm -hmm. even 17 years later. So you're absolutely right when you say, don't put a time limit on it. Mm -hmm. You grieve the way you grieve. I grieve the way I grieve. Everybody grieves a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And, and if you want to be supportive, just be be kind of looking out for the signs that the person is is displaying to you and it's the obvious communication signs that we we use in the rest of our, our lives you know if they if they look like they want to talk and they're they're expressing that they want to talk or they're telling you they want to talk even better make sure you yeah. listen if not perhaps don't take that personally that's not about you it's just about the time at the moment there that they are. right mm -hmm. just be there for them and try and be there again because they may decide that time that time comes yes but when you mentioned well funny in an ironic kind of way that you mentioned that sort of um idea of well you, you you can you can have another child um that again if we think about the grief recovery institute we talk about the myths of of grief and that's one of them around replace the loss and it's one that we quite often use with um with pet bereavement mm. so if you've lost an animal then we'll you can get another animal it's okay and we do that with children we do it all the time if the goldfish dies we might replace the goldfish right but then that's a tool that we've shown our children mm -hmm. that would apply to grief. And then well, if grandma dies, how do we do that? That doesn't yeah. work. It doesn't that work. Things make things complicated and, and can, can exacerbate things and make things difficult. Robert says, Dr. Wilson Crane, I specialized in the core, not the Band-Aid crap, as he says, of a person's grief. He just added you as a friend. Oh, there you go. Good. And he also says he lost his wife, three brothers, all my grandparents and parents have. I've learned through others how to grieve without suffering or getting depressed. Wow. That's so good. That's to a hear. lot of loss. It's an awful lot of loss. We, we will connect. It would be, be great to have a conversation, Robert, if you'd like to do that. I'd be keen to learn the kind of things that you've done. So is it, is there such a thing as healthy grieving? Um. I would say so. Yes, I would say there are ways to, um, and I, I, I don't use the phrase about getting over because I don't think people get over it. I think mm -hmm. people might find a way around it or find a way to live with it. Yes, um, I think the overall kind of the healthy grieving is to do it in in your own way and not not try and do something that feels unnatural to you or feels uncomfortable to you. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the tools in the in the grief recovery method did certainly helped me help me and that was around um considering the relationship that i'd had with um and it was actually another loss that i chose to to do that kind of completion process they call it um mm. first of all. and i looked at that relationship because i was able to identify really positive things that had happened in that relationship and also some not so positive things but it gave me an overview that i'd had generally quite a balanced relationship with this person that I was really struggling to to complete the loss with mm. and then beyond that um I did the final stage of the recovery method which is writing a letter 
mm. and you don't write a letter that goes to them. Yes. Because actually, if they've died, that's impossible anyway. But you write a letter which is about you expressing your feelings. And yes. there's a number of particular things that, that the, the method encourages you to face, and that's significant emotional statements or apologies you might wish to make or forgivenesses mm. you might wish to offer. Yes. And that's a really yes. healthy way to address a relationship that maybe span year, years and years. Um, but it gives you a chance to say the things you didn't say, to communicate the things that that you didn't have the chance to communicate. And again, with, with sudden death, there can be possibly many more of those that, that you perhaps don't expect. Yeah. And I found that quite useful. And, and for me, um, yeah, quite a healthy way to... Um, to think about the relationship, to think about the fact that I don't have that relationship with that living person any longer mm. and think about how I can communicate with them in a different way to try and help me feel better than mm. I was. No, I love that. I think that's beautiful because it's your way, as you say, of completing that cycle, if you will. And there's no reason why you can't continue to write letters to them over time, right? That's right. The other the other thing I want to point out is grief also happens with the living in terms of the loss of a friendship, the loss of a job suddenly, different areas where grief shows up. Because I said, as I said at the top, grief, go, we go to grief when we're hurt. So if a relationship suddenly is severed for whatever reason, you grieve. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah. And, and it, even with happy situations, this is something that um, that I've learned an awful lot over the last sort of 18 months or so, that even when you make an active choice to do something, um, there can be an element of grief. So you said there about, about lo losing a job, but even making an active choice to go and be employed somewhere else mm -hmm. means that you, um, you maybe uh, don't see friends and colleagues that you were close to that you saw every day because let's face it we sometimes spend more of our lives with our colleagues than we do with our family yes, yes. Um, there can be situations where um, even just the loss of that routine causes grief-like feelings mm -hmm. um, one of the definitions that the grief recovery method talk about is just the change in normal patterns of behavior and that's what leads mm -hmm. to grief. so yes. even, even if that pattern of behavior was a bad pattern of behavior, we might grieve it. So it could be um, a negative relationship, but we're still in grief because that has changed. Or it can be, as I say, you've made a positive choice. You've had a promotion and you've mm -hmm. moved place of work, maybe even just moved teams within the same organization. Mm -hmm. There can be elements of grief there. Um, and again, if we think about grief um, as being cumulative, if we do experience grief in these different ways, if we if we only think about it in terms of bereavement, we might think, oh, well, depending on your situation, we may have only had a couple of instances of what we know is grief during our lives. Right. But actually, if you think about it as other losses, so that could mm -hmm. be um, loss, as you talked about, in terms of um, losing a job or losing financial security, um, elements of loss of identity, yes all different types of behaviors with all those being cumulative and all of those building up unless we find a way to deal with it and process it mm -hmm. we are at risk of um yeah having difficulties down the line really with with not being able to deal with perhaps something when it happens as, as a bereavement yes absolutely and recognizing it for what it is right because a lot of times, as I said, people stuff their feelings mm. down and don't deal with it or sit with it and recognize, hey, I'm grieving. I'm sad. Yeah. This is a loss. Right. And then going forward with helping themselves through recovery. Yeah. And it, it's such a taboo subject as well. Death and dying. People don't choose to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um it didn't happen so much to, to, to me, um, but I know it can happen when people have died that people avoid you a little bit, partly because they don't know what to say, yeah. partly because of that fear of saying the wrong thing, as we've talked about. So yes. um, that in itself can be isolating because there is a kind of sense of, oh, I don't want to bother them and I'll, I'll, I'll leave them and they'll, they'll, they'll come to me when they're ready, when actually yeah. the person might be, might be really in need of somebody to reach out to them. Yes. So, Again, if we're thinking about things that you can do, um, I would say 
don't don't make it don't make an irritation of yourself and don't don't make yourself a pest but do try and reach out out to people and do listen for even the non-verbal signs of yeah I'd like to be in touch but I, I don't know what to say um yeah. because it, it it can just be so helpful one of the most helpful things um somebody did for me was just that kind of regular checking in and not mm-hmm. really expecting me to respond as well so yes I just yes. said regular text message I knew what it meant um but it was just that I am here for you and and you don't and you don't have to that they also weren't needy on their side they weren't needing to be needed by me right which was helpful to me because I didn't feel like I had to look after them but yes because were... you were already in the process of looking after all these other people in your family mm-hmm. your other nieces and nephews your your you know um the parents of this of your you know the child like you had your your parents Mm -hmm. right the grandparents you had so many people to support supporting outside people would have been so difficult to do yeah too much but try and maybe draw that support from people who are further out than you who possibly are grieving themselves as well um you know either from this situation or from other situations Mm -hmm. but um i found it very useful to be able to draw upon um their support when I needed it because that then helped me be as strong as I could be then to be the support to people who were even closer to the epicenter as I say than than I was the core the Mm. core group and do you find it helpful to talk about her absolutely yeah and that's actually the last line in my book says that it just says let me talk about her let me tell you yeah Yeah. that's a bit well tell me a little bit about her yeah so um she was my, my first and only niece um, and she arrived in uh, 1997 and we, we didn't know whether she would be a boy or a girl, but we had a name prepared in case she was a girl. Yeah. And I got a phone call. I was I was in my first job and I got a phone call at work to say, um, and her name was Mary Lou and we and it was my mum and she just said, we've got a Mary Lou. Aww. And I just said to my line manager, okay, I'm off and I don't know when I'm going to be back <laughs> and just left. Um, I lived about two hours drive from uh, from where they were at that time um, and I just drove because I just I knew I needed to be there um, and we spent we spent quite a lot of time when she was little and I, I moved back to the area shortly after she was born and we spent quite a lot of bit of time together when we were little uh, when she was little and I was sort of in my early 20s mm-hmm. um, and yeah just did normal family things we were a relatively normal family I think um, lots of fun memories of um just things at home playing games going out to the park just doing normal things and then as she as she started to get older um she was very very keen student and was very into her schoolwork and studied law um okay and she actually went to university um only about 30 minutes away from from where we live across here so she wasn't here all the time but she occasionally would come and stay with us and we talk into them in sort of small hours of the morning about all sorts of things because she was a very, very quiet, um, very quiet child, but mm-hmm. became quite an opinionated teenager, which I absolutely loved when she became older. And she was her opinions were very well formed. So it was great to speak to her. Um, and that's I think that's pretty what I miss the most now is that I was just loving getting to know her as an adult. Yeah. You have a different relationship with with your niece um than you do with your own children. You have a different right. relationship um I know I, I could I could get away with all sorts of things really and she was uh, <laughs> she was helpful in kind of the communications between our family you know she'd let me know what was going on and I'd let her, her know what was going on so mm-hmm. just hugely missed because um and also that that sort of anticipatory grief of I miss now the fact that she won't be around when I grow older and Mm. I have said in the book that I expected she might look after me when I was older and we don't think we ever ever spoke about that I just assumed that she (laughs) this was her job she was going to look after you when you get older okay (laughs) yeah and and now she's not so it's it's a lot of that around the things that we just won't get to do anymore and I think that's probably the hardest thing when you lose somebody so young you're left with lots of lovely memories um but yeah just those sort of um we won't get to do the things that I hope we might get to do. So she was chief bridesmaid when when I got married, um, but I won't see her. I won't see her wedding. Mm. You know, there'll be lots of milestones, lots of family milestones where she won't be present. Um, certainly not not in body. Hopefully in spirit, but not in body. Mm. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. And you'll and those milestones are be the times where you will include her somehow, you know, with a you know, some people use a rose to mm -hmm. signify the the person being there but not being there. Different ways, I think, as time goes on. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that would be a lovely way to remember her and it and to let people know it's okay to talk about the person that's not here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm yeah and i think that's it and i think i think covid has been challenging in that respect because mm. um we haven't actually had lots of and we didn't have lots of family events anyway we're a tiny family but we didn't have lots of family things going on um as we might have done you know we might have done that towards the summer of the first year after she died possibly um but we haven't had that and it's it's a little bit um a little bit worrying about what it, what it will feel like to get together um, as a family when she's when she's not there but it, it will yeah. happen and we will do it um, and yeah there will be ways I'm sure that we can we can remember her but I think again that's that message of people do generally want to talk about the person so yes um, there is a level a, a sort of level of avoidance that people say oh I, I, don't, I don't want to say anything because I'm going to I'm going to um, I'm going to remind them or and um, I hadn't forgotten so mm -hmm. you're not going to remind me um and you're not going to make me any more upset than i am now so exactly <laughs> exactly you go right on ahead and 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 talk about it now i know that as i said at the start this is not the case for everybody mm -hmm. but um certainly from my point of view that opportunity to talk about her and talk about what happened even is still mm -hmm. still so fresh even though yeah. you know two years down the line but it doesn't feel like two years like when I think of the people that have passed in my life, it doesn't feel like to like my mom passed away in, you know, June of 2019. Doesn't feel like it's going to be that long. It feels like it was just, you know, a couple of months ago. Yeah. And that's the thing about time is we learn how to uh, live with the grief. Yeah. Right. And then as time goes on each day, it gets a little bit less painful. Mm -hmm. right yeah I think so and then and then sometimes it can just hit you and it can be things that you just don't expect and that's that's sometimes probably the hardest when um when time has gone on mm -hmm. that something will happen either someone will say something or you'll hear something or see something or you know people talk about things like pieces of music or mm -hmm. a piece of artwork or it could be a phrase that someone says and I just think with that it's just go with it feel the feels as you said you know just go with it um yeah and, and don't be questioning it um i i am a sort of firm believer in things things kind of happening for a reason and also i'm i'm, I'm quite a quite a spiritual person and believe that these people are still around us in some way so if you do feel like you're getting a sign um go with it i like to believe that too actually uh, sometimes uh, things will happen that are not explained and I'll be like, okay, mom, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> or a song comes on the radio just as a, an, uh, you know, something's happening in your life and the song is so relevant. You're like, this can't be, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, okay, mom, <laughs> yeah. you're telling, you're telling me something. I get it. Okay. I need to pay attention. <laughs> and you may or may not believe that. But it's what we believe. And that's and that also brings a smile to your face, thinking that maybe that person is sitting beside me right now as I am embarking on this life. Or maybe they are at this wedding that I'm at of this family member mm -hmm. with us. Yeah. Right. And that gives us a sense of peace almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. For me, it's been um it's been blackbirds. I know people talk about robins quite a lot, certainly in the UK. But that's the same for you in the states but in the uk people talk about robins um little tiny birds that, that come but actually for me it's, it's it's blackbirds and it was very very shortly after she died um i was sitting in our um at our dining table and don't normally look out of the window but looked out the window and there was blackbirds and mm. they just seemed to appear just at the right time there was one this morning just on the on the bird bath um and yeah that's the sort of thing that does make me smile and yeah. If there's nothing in it, there's no harm done. But exactly, it, nice. So, absolutely, 
Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing your journey with us about your loss of your niece. And I am truly sorry you had to go through that loss because that is, you know, so young and so traumatic for you all. And so my condolences to you and your family. But thank you for sharing your book, 16 Days with the World and How to Process Grief. So where can they find your book? Yeah, so directly from my uh, website, which is uh, books.drvictoriawilsoncrane.co.uk. Or it's sorry, sorry, that was way oh. too fast for my table. <laughs> <laughs> so I only got books dot. <laughs> uh, Doctor, Dr. Victoria Wilson Crane, all one word, dot co dot UK. Dot and the reason I put my dot site, UK. Yeah, is um, there'll be a, you can order a signed copy from there. Um, if you want to go down uh, the Amazon route, that's perfect. Yeah good on the Amazon awesome. route. Um, it's available from Amazon and it's on Kindle as well as um, as a as a soft copy book. So, but if you order directly from me, um, it'd be a signed copy of the book uh, with a few little extras. And in, in the book, as you say, there's a description of what happened, but I've also got a compilation of some hopefully sound advice to, to help people because I read an awful lot of books when this happened to me, but I couldn't really find anything that talked to me as an, as an auntie. Um, so I just found it quite useful to note some of the things that might be helpful for people who are on those kind of um, outer circles of grief, as I call them. Yes, and I think that would be really helpful because, we, like we said at the beginning, it isn't just the core, it's everybody around. It's this ripple effect that happens sure. when we feel this grief and loss. So that's wonderful that you have that book specifically designed for the people in that outer circle. That's fantastic. Okay. So go to her website or go to Amazon and Kindle. 16 Days is the called is the book name is what I'm trying to spit out by Dr. Victoria Wilson Crane. Thank you again so much for joining me on this episode of What Has Changed Your Life. If you think somebody could use this advice, like and share. Share it with as many people as possible and how to go through grief in a healthy way. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time on What Has Changed Your Life. Thanks, Tracy. You are welcome. <laughs>